to the whys and wherefores of what made that work. And that's the real power because once you do that, then the, the brain power of everybody who's really intimate with doing this type of work then gets the aha moment to think more broadly about other implications of what they just saw. So when we iterate through this, we'll see other things. As, as I said here, we're going to learn that in the actual result, when you deploy that plan, it's not going to be exactly what this thing forecasted. Um, it'll be better than where you were, but it won't be exactly this result. And there are different reasons for it. One may be that the metrics you're using to define the recipe, so to speak, um, wasn't exactly correct. It was a swag. But when you get that actual data back, you can then use that and refine your metrics so that every time you run this, you're getting a better and better result. And then what businesses will do is they'll say, well, geez, now I get how this thing works. I want to deploy this tool in this part of my business, right? So for us, it's been great because we, we're helping our clients do things. And it's actually, this isn't costly like big cognitive computing technology. But it, it's, it's very practical, and uh, you know, we, we get a lot of result with it. Another one, too, I'll just describe a use case that one of my colleagues had when he gave this presentation last year at another event. It wasn't, so this isn't my experience, but I was pretty um, profoundly uh, impressed with it in terms of what the result was. Um, this was for a manufacturing company where it was a, um, uh, I think it was a paper making business, and they had obviously trees or raw materials. But they had mills that ran all over the country. And um, the business said to um, you know, our, our deployment team at the time, you know, help us, can you help us improve profitability? You know, we're not really sure we want to take this, but let's look at the tool and see where we can, we can go with it. So our team went in and got a whole lot of source data, you know, supply data from all these various uh, mills, um, sourcing agents from, from the various forestry groups where they buy the raw materials. And then there's a whole sort of shipping component and distribution component to get the material in to, uh, to make the, the, the paper. Um, what, what, this, what this tool ended up saying in terms of optimizing was a suggestion that said a certain mill, I hope I get this right, you would move the distribution from one mill to another um, that had never been done before, by the way to optimize throughput. And the individual at each of these mills said, that, that doesn't make any sense. Like, these people are here 10, 20, 30 years. And they said, this, this result is it's nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. And they're like, well, no, the data says it, it works. So they went back and they looked at the, at the whys and wherefores of the scenario. And what they found out was there was some step in the supply chain process that preceded the delivery to the mill that nobody had visibility into that was fundamentally impacting the throughput, but for whatever, 15, 20 years, nobody ha had that visibility, so they didn't know what they didn't know about the problem, where the system caught it because they could see the timing effects of everything, everything that was going on. So it's really a, an impactful um, solution that can be implied broadly. I would say this, I mean, I'm, we didn't do a show of hands, but how many of you are um, you know, in industry, I know we did the, the industries themselves, but in business versus working at Villanova? Uh, business, okay, good, good hand you. Um, I'd, I'd say a common way that this gets used today is, um, you know, PMO, project-based processes or process groups that exist within organizations to do process improvement. Oftentimes, it's just an environment where you're dealing with limited people and budgets, and you're asked to do a lot of stuff. So folks who are familiar with the IT environment, you always have a backlog of, of projects and, and pipeline of work that needs to get done, and you never have time to get to all of it. So um, tool, solutions like this can really help get to um, a, a, better, a better result. So what's, what's the path forward? You know, for example, if um, your organization were, tr were to get into sort of a, a project like this, engaging an enterprise optimizer type, type of solution, um, you know, the idea would be first to model the business context. So getting a sense of how do I optimize my de demand, my finance uh, supply, um, pulling in together your detailed constraints, um, and then getting an understanding by doing an analysis of your P&L, your chart of accounts, um, and then what decisions it is that you want to model. So the real, the real key in this type of project um, is understanding what it is you want to solve for first. Most, most clients that bring us in bring us in because they have some business problem that 
um, has been sort of longstanding or, or, or hamstringing them for a while. And as I said in the previous use case, we actually developed that on behalf of the client without even them asking. We all saw this problem and they thought that's just the way it is in this world. We're like, no, there's a better way. But clients will come to us and they'll, they'll, they'll try to do sort of a forensic view of something that's wrong in their organization around, uh, around operations and, and we'll, we'll develop a, a solution for them. But the, the key here is um, you know, data requirements is a really, really important piece of this. Uh, I don't care if you're doing just generic descriptive analytics or prescriptive analytics or cognitive computing you're going to find that the data piece is huge. You've got to have a good handle around master data management, around data structures. You've got to have clean data, you know, garbage in, garbage out is the old rule. So a lot of our projects will just start with a review of the data environment and get a good sense of where everything is. Um, and then we'll, we'll work with our clients to kind of go through an initial process design of, of really architecting the model for the business in terms of how it works. And then we'll iterate through a pilot to demonstrate the output. In a lot of cases, our clients will show them a sample output that's got real impacts, real bottom dollar impacts, before they've essentially paid dollar one to buy any software. I mean, think about the old world of spending millions of dollars to implement an ERP accounting system to improve your sort of enterprise-wide business processes, and you know, two years into it, you're still trying to figure out where that investment return is. I mean, this, this has totally flipped that on its head and so, uh, and it's good because you know business deserves that. Now it's been been long time in coming, but technology allows us to do that better today. So you know, summary thoughts: What comes first, chicken or the egg? That really is about um, you know where do I start with this, right? So you've got a working environment, you've got your business running today, and most of our clients that hire us, obviously they're intimate with with the things that work well in their business. They understand their strategic planning. They understand the sort of the, the pain points. Um, but what we need to do in every case is we have to set up a baseline. And a baseline means making certain assumptions about how the business works today. Once you've done that, you've gotten through or started through the iteration process of, um, of you know, running actual scenarios, that's when the question about chicken or the egg becomes irrelevant because it, it starts to take on a life and an evolution that improves over time. Um, <clears throat> what about the data? We talked, I talked just a minute ago about that. Um, data's key, right? Without that, you're sort of at a stopping point. Um, and again, getting to the, the comparison, so to speak, to, to cognitive computing, um, just as a reminder, if you have an environment like this whole discussion in, in, in this presentation has been around within the four walls of a business to optimize profitability, the, the type of data that's going to give you that answer, by and large, is always going to be really re hard structured data, right? All the sort of this amorphous image-based stuff that you saw in the prior presentation, it's not really relevant to getting to profitability. Businesses can, businesses can be very, very profitable. They can optimize profitability, guaranteed, if they just get the data that they have in order, right? And apply these kind of uh, tools to, to get to the result. The, the challenge, and then the next step, and remember there are these six levels of financial information, that sixth level of time-based um, adherence or, or um, inspection is really around these emerging trends in robotics. And robotics is the generic form of the cognitive computing that Boris was talking about earlier. Do you, do you have a question? So talk to me about the basis part of this. How many of your So activity-based costing, good question. A lot of our public services clients do. Um, in our commercial businesses, we, we don't see a lot of it. Um, it does come up when, we're, when clients go through change, so event-based change. If they want to run a business case for you know, outsourcing or organizational redesign, there's a lot of activity-based costing projects that go on for that. Um, the newer trend uh, we see today is more of a top-down view. Um, it's, it's global business management, which really isolates on the key metrics that drive your business. And then you're making business decisions top down based on those metrics drivers. It's really a lot of what I just went through in this presentation. The bottom up activity based costing, there's a debate about, about the, uh, you know, what you get out of that, but it's important. Um, but it's just one piece. It, it doesn't really tell the whole picture. Um, 
the way you can sort of top down if you just drive your business through whatever the key metrics are that, that, uh, that you run your business with. The, I want to come back to this, the emerging trends in robotics and cognitive computing. So where does this come into play? Because everything I just talked about, again, within the four walls of the business, you're trying to optimize on profitability. Let's say you're doing that. So this tool's been in place, you've run through a number of iterations, you're, you've optimized, you're thrilled, you're getting profit. The question is, what's next? Well, what's next could be merger or acquisition. It could be a new product line. It could be some regulatory threat out in the marketplace. Something that doesn't exist today within your business is really what's next. That's where the cognitive computing and the robotics comes in. For us, it's looking outward, extending out from your business into the world. And you saw Boris with his APIs. That's when you start to run integration and start to pull in information that you don't have about the, about the possibilities based on information that doesn't even exist in your business to start to inform on where do you take your business next. And that's really the tie-in that we see. I think, in theory, you could apply robotics and cognitive computing to doing the profitability solve, but it's like a sledgehammer on a nail. It just doesn't, it's not practical. Um, and then there's a whole lot of discussion around things we could spend many hours on, but we're not going to have a ton of time left, um, on technology to do better communication, collaboration, and sharing of knowledge. So there's a lot of sort of the softer side of things in terms of human inter interactions to getting these types of initiatives off the ground, to making them successful. You know, I talked about the example where the guy on the shop floor didn't know that there was some, some supply chain issue in the Pacific Northwest. So there, there's, a, there's always a human element here that's, that's coming into play. Um, and then there's a change management piece to this too. But I would say, by and large, relative to your traditional advisory project or IT project for a data warehouse, or ERP or what have you, this solution is a very light footprint in terms of capital cost to get started. The effort is really in exploring the opportunities by understanding how the business works and then being able to model that business in a tool like this. So those are all the prepared remarks. Happy to answer questions, talk about this as much time as we have. Mm -hmm. the, the tool is moving from the current state down to the future yep. state. When you do the current state assessment, a lot of that is really on, like you said, gathering the data, making sure that you're able to inform towards the future state. Mm -hmm. From the percentage of your clients that you've worked with, um, how often or how frequent have you come across where the current state debt is, is disparate, almost dysfunctional to some degree, and, mm -hmm. versus those clients that actually have a really good solid data set to work from? So 98% is the dysfunctional. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so I it, I kind of that, but I it's funny. We're actually, we just, we just started a project with a startup, well-funded startup. So we're actually building their business from scratch. It's, it's the most wonderful project I've ever had because there's nothing there. <laughs> we're, we're starting everything on the platform. We're controlling it so they don't you know, go sideways with all this other shadow systems. So that's great. But no, it's usually very dysfunctional. And so how do we get into those kind of projects and make them successful? One is we, we start small. So thank you for that last bullet. You want to start small. You want to get to a very focused area of the business that you can solve a relevant business problem on profitability. So you take a component of the business. You want to get the right stakeholders that allow you to navigate that small world. So you're going to have disparate data sources. You're going to have dirty data. So you've got to, you've got to focus on getting that cleaned up and understand it and rationalize it. Um, and then um, the other part of the conversation is, is modeling the business process so that you can generate some results. What we find is it's, it's a little bit of a sort of a Pavlov's dog scenario where we, we get success in a small way, we broadcast that success, and then people get interested, and then they say, what did you do there? And then you start to describe it. And I'll tell you, once people see the benefit, they go back to their part of the business and they get their house in order to, they, they want us to come in and start to look at their, their world. One of the other things we do too is sometimes they'll just give us a data set. Right? Without getting all encumbered with all the integration and the disparate data sources, let's take one source of data that's got a lot of content and just give it to us and we'll analyze it. We'll just run it through our system and see what patterns come out. Right? We may present patterns back to them that they weren't looking for or we weren't looking for, and they'll be like, well, that's interesting. Let's, let's explore that further. So there's different ways in which we 
sort of get some traction. But there's always going to be the, um, you know, and, and especially in the larger organizations, we have, uh, you know, we, we say to IT, you know, we want to get access to X, Y, Z, and they're like, wait a minute, you're not, you're not touching my world, right? So, and there's other tools out there today where you can actually deploy, and I actually presented this at another, um, one, of, one of Tom's MBA events. Um, there's technology where you can actually deploy access to underlying data that you can extract without building data warehouses. And that's another way to get access to some of that. So. And just to add to that, uh, I used to be uh, spent about 10 plus years on the IT side, mm -hmm. and now I start to move into the analytics side. Uh, one of the very, uh, I can, certainly can attest to, there is a disconnection between IT and the business unit. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the cause of a lot of those data, even though they're being collected, mm -hmm. but they don't collect it in a purposeful um, direction, a purposeful focus. Right. And that's why you have that issue where your data becomes so unorganized. Yep. So there's some disconnection there. That, that's a great point. It actually made me think of something else too. When you're interacting with different parts of the business, you know, sometimes to get this to all come together, it's not quick. I mean, it takes some time. It's, it's sort of ratchety. Um, but there are, you know, you saw with Boar Assisting did it this morning, the whole idea of real time, real time response. So that's where the robotics and cognitive computing can really help accelerate some of this stuff on the real high end. Um, one of the examples that was interesting to me, which he presented the thing about fashion. It's funny because one of our clients or um, network colleagues has an um, example where they were doing a lot of online um, sales of clothing, right? And what they discovered was that there was this sp spike in um, purchases at like 2 a.m. on Saturday or Sunday morning. And you think, well, why would people be buying things on Sunday morning? And they did the analysis and they realized when people go out and they go to parties and loosen up with you know, cocktails and things, they tend to be less restrained on buying things. So they really had this spike happening at, you know, so now they're planning their business around marketing things and doing sales at these crazy points during the week where people are buying. <laughs> but, but that real-time feedback, so if you could accelerate that and say, hey, maybe I see a spike on a Tuesday night because there's a, back to the weather patterns, there's a, there's a snowstorm, everybody's at home, nothing to do, I'm going to start buying stuff. But if you could track that stuff in real time, obviously you're gonna get that incremental profit. Now, everything we talked about, that's not what this does. That is what the robotics piece does. But practically speaking, most of our clients are living in the, in the traditional world where the decision making isn't instant, but quarterly or monthly making good decisions about profitability. So. What are some of the, I guess, key constraints that you analyze that tend to cross over It's, it's, it's people, it's the biggest business problem is you have limited resources that need to solve critical business problems and a finite budget, but you have demand to produce things that you just simply can't meet. So the question is, what choice am I gonna make about deploying my, my human resources in my business to optimize what they're doing for the business, right? So you can have a lot of cost fixed cost essentially with your, with your human resources, and they're just not doing the right value added stuff and it's hard to really make those decisions. And a perfect example is if I'm out auditing, which is an important function today in, in a regulatory environment, I'm auditing important control in a business that I don't want to get dinged for, but I have a regulation over here that says if I don't do this, I may have some cyber security attack. I have, I have this one person with the skill, where do I deploy them, right? It's, it's that kind of business problem that is the most critical thing that the businesses are wrestling with today. Any other questions? 